What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to JDD TV. I'm your host, Josh, and we are back for another episode of our Canadian Men's National Team Abroad series, where each and every week we keep you updated with how our Canucks are performing abroad. Now, this week's update will be from February 17th to the 23rd. I'm recording on Wednesday morning, and basically this week we're going to focus a lot on some of the transfers that happened over January and whether those transfers are panning out so far, because some game time has been thrown up in the air and we want to discuss it here today. So hopefully you guys are excited for this episode. You'll be sure to drop a like on the episode. Drop a sub if you guys are new to the channel and let's get into the update now. All right, guys, like we always do, we're going to start in England and we're going to start with Richie Larea, a player that I wasn't actually going to touch on. I wasn't going to touch on him because he hasn't been playing, but I felt like that's all the more reason to touch on him. Now, last night at around midnight, I put up a tweet and I was surprised with the amount of engagement it got just given the fact that it was midnight and I just wasn't expecting to get a ton of engagement. But I basically questioned Lorea's time so far at, at Forest and saying that it could potentially, and I was exaggerating a little bit, but potentially be a disaster because the, with the World Cup coming up, I expected Lorea to have a little bit more of an impact, not just be an unused sub and not even making the bench so far because he has not played a single second. And I know a lot of the hype was created because the Canadians were excited, the Toronto media, a TFC player. Like I understand all that, but I still felt like Richie Lorea proved himself at TFC with some incredible seasons. I know the team wasn't having the best season when he left. But he's also establishing himself in one of the greatest stories in soccer right now, and that is the Canadian men's national team. So you'd assume one way, shape, or form, he would have been integrated a little bit right now. Now, I get the whole settling down thing. There's a lot of different examples out there, the success of Tejon walking into teams. And again, I know it's different given the fact that Tejon had that winter break. But I still think it's a little bit surprising. So I want to hear from you guys in the comments. Do you think it's a little bit surprising? Are you worried? Or is it one of the things where... I think that because Lowe and Spence are both on loan, both are performing very well, both have brought Nottingham from a poor start to the season up to potential promotion playoff bound team, that potentially they just don't want to give Larea that chance yet. Knowing that both players are on loan, they're going to leave. Larea will get his chance next season. Use this season to adapt and get in, and then next season it's all yours. I don't know, but I thought the tweet was very interesting with some of the re remarks because a lot of you guys agreed. A lot of you guys just basically said give him time, and I respect both opinions, which is why I wanted to bring it up here today. All right, guys, now moving on over to Junior Hoylet, whose Reading side looked to be a disastrous season with the six point deduction, with the atrocious form, but it looks like they finally turned a corner as Hoylet was able to start and he started at the left attacking mid in a 4 2 3 1, playing 67 minutes, hit an 81% pass completion, 27 touches, wasn't able to have any shots on net, but Reading won. They did it. They won. They won 3 2 against Preston. And on top of that, midweek, the match that happened yesterday, Hoylet started once again as a left attacking mid in that same 4 2 3 1, playing 74 minutes, looked very lively throughout the match, helping Reading to win 2 1 over Birmingham to sit 21st in the table with a 10. 5 and 18 record on 29 points, 8 points off 22nd place Derby County. And if you guys have followed the Derby County story, it's quite incredible too. They had a 21 point deduction. So really, I think even with the the point deduction, I think both of them would have been out of the relegation zone, but Reading are right around there and it's going to be a little bit nerve-wracking for Derby because they're definitely picking up some steam. It's an 8 point gap though, so those two massive massive wins are going to hopefully help Hoylet and Reading avoid relegation. Dropping down a league, we're going to do a quick update on Theo Corbiano, who, after his really successful start at MK Dons, has been kind of used as a bit part role. And yesterday, midweek match for him, he was subbed on in the 71st minute. He had two successful take-ons, 22 touches, was fouled twice. He was pretty impactful for under 20 minutes worth of work. And with that, MK Dons won 2-0 over Charlton. And with that impressive win, they're still third in the table with an 18 nine and seven record. I'd like to see Theo get a little bit more time. I mean, after that start, he just seemed to fit right in at that winger position. So hopefully he can find a little bit of run of form to get his side back in the team, but good stuff there. And MK Dons are definitely looking like real promotion contenders this season. Moving along now to the Arsenal Academy, taking a look at Marcelo Flores, who I heard on Football Americas had some new kicks, but it was uh, decked out in the, you know, the Mexican side of things. So that's a, I don't know if that's a big indication for you guys at all of where his future leans. I've always told you guys I'm firmly believe he's not going to pick Canada, but there's been rumors that he wants to see what a camp would be like. So seeing the, the kicks isn't surprising that he's got that Mexican flair to him, but let's give you guys the update with him regardless. But can Marcelo Flores had the start for the Arsenal Academy and played 87 minutes in a 1-1 draw against Leicester City. And with that, Arsenal sit third in the table with a 9-6-4 record. Marcelo getting these type of minutes, getting these types of looks, it's just a matter of time, I think, before he gets a sniff at Arsenal and obviously... Gonna be put in a position where he's gonna have to make a decision. 
and kicks aside. It does seem like he's leaning toward Mexico, but we will keep you guys updated along the way as this was another good successful week for Marcelo Flores. Moving along to Germany now, we're going to take a look at Scott Kennedy and his side, Jan Rangensberg, who took on Nuremberg at the weekend. Kennedy did start in that match, played 90 minutes as a center back in a 4-4-2, but unfortunately, him and his side slipped to Nuremberg 2-0, and they now sit 10th in the table with a 9-4-10 record, losing four in a row. It's a really productive start to the season for Kennedy, and this side looked like they'd be potential promotion contenders, but they've just completely lost the plot. They've lost form, and... It kind of looks like if they're not too careful, they're going to slip into a potential relegation. Now, that's probably a bit of a stretch, but the way that they're playing right now, it's not super ideal. The important thing, though, is that Kennedy is playing, and he's relatively playing well most of the time, but I'd like to see him and his side find a little bit more cohesion, find a way to get back to winning ways, and make sure, at the least, they can figure out a way to finish mid-table in the Bundesliga 2 this season. Heading on over to France, now we're going to take a look at Jonathan David, the second player alongside Richie Larea. I was really looking forward to touching on this week. We know what he did with Canada and what I think is probably his most impressive window ever, but his club form with Lille is really scaring me. Considering the incredible start that he had, how quickly he got to 12 goals, he's really started to slip up and hasn't been able to find the back of the net. And these are the stories of the last two matches, which did not really change for him. As David started and played all 90 minutes as a striker in a 4-4-2 system, he did have 51 touches for a striker who plays in a 4-4-2 is not a bad whatsoever. He had four shots as well, 74% pass completion. The service to him was definitely lacking as Lille drew 0-0 to Metz. And with that, the record goes to 9-9-7, and 36 points, and they sit 11th in the table. I know we've talked about inconsistency with this side. We always do, but this is... A little getting a little bit ridiculous. Lil should be expected to win this type of match after seeing some of the performances they had this season and some of the good highlights. And then to take on the strugglers like Mets, not be able to find a way through, have a very frustrating nil nil match. And then again, Jonathan David extending this goalless streak for club. He followed that up yesterday with a match in the Champions League. Really exciting day for him. And unfortunately, though, it, it, it was just as frustrating as he started, played 81 minutes as a striker in a 4 2 3 1 system. Had another very frustrating match, in my opinion. He did have 38 touches, but I didn't think it was too bad. Two shots, one was blocked, one was off target. And with it, Lille lost the first leg 2-0 to Chelsea. And David has not scored for Lille in two months, seven matches right now. That's got to get broken. Hopefully at the weekend, we can see David find a way to get it through. Or even potentially, I mean, hey, break it at home against Chelsea. That's not a bad way to get it done. But it is a little bit concerning. And I don't know if his mind is looking a little bit elsewhere. There's been a lot of rumors. I want to address the Dortmund rumor, guys. It's absolutely not true. I've talked to a few sources. There's there's not a legitimate link linking Dortmund to David, but there are some other teams sniffing around. The Arsenal name pops back up. Inters come back into the mix. It'll be very interesting for me to see where Jonathan David goes. I think he's excited for that move, but he needs to find a way to make this last season right now with Lille as successful as it can, and that's starting with finding the back of the net. One Canadian striker might not have scored in Ligue 1, but another one certainly did, as Ike Ugbo and his new side, Toa, took on Rennes. They unfortunately lost 4-1 to in that match, and the two matches that Ike has played, they've lost 5-1 and 4-1, so not the greatest start, but in this match, he did start. He played 60 minutes as a striker in a 5-3-2 system. I thought Ugbo was very solid throughout the match. He had an 82% pass completion, only 14 touches, which is dramatically, dramatically low. But he was able to score a back post header as well to at least give Trois a fighting chance at the time. And with that loss, Trois sat 17th in the table with a 5, 6, and 14 record on 21 points. And from 17th to 20th, they are all tied on 21 points. So they're tied with Bordeaux at bottom of the table. This is going to be a real relegation, grueling kind of fight here. And I'm a little bit nervous for Trois because they're not on good form and they're conceding left, right, and center. But hopefully with Ugbo kind of finding his way in Liga, it'll be a bit of a boost for them to at least try to find a goal scorer in this squad. But a little bit nerve- nerve-wracking times. It'll be an interesting team to keep an eye on. Heading on over to Belgium now, we're going to take a look at Tejan Buchanan, who's really found a way to break into a starting 11, which is everything you want to see from a new transfer. And, and Tejan definitely locked that up. As he started once again, he went 83 minutes as a left wing back in a 3-5-2 system. He had an 84% pass completion record, three shots, 50 touches, and was very active throughout the match, helping Club Bruges win 3-1 to to move up to second in the table with a 15-9-4 record. Probably a tough task to see if they can go for the first place position. They're 10 points off of it, but regardless, they're finding a little bit of form under new management. It's great to see Tejan being influential throughout the match. Dropping down a league in Belgium, we're going to take a look at Liam Frazier, who 
Unfortunately, wasn't able to complete the match as he started as a CDM in a 4-2-3-1 system, but was subbed off on the 37th minute with a knock as Dians drew 1-1 to sit fourth in the table with a 6-11-4 record. This did look like a side that was going to compete for promotion, but there's just too many draws in them right now. Not enough match winners in it, and they were hoping with Liam Frazier coming in, blossoming up that midfield, it would give them that chance, but they just can't seem to find a way to get it done. Hopefully, Liam gets back as soon as he can and at least try to give them some type of late push to go up for promotion place. Moving on over to Chile now and taking a look at Huachipato and Cardova, who Cardova, again, has found a way to lock down that right back position for Huachipato. He started and went all 90 minutes as a right back in a 4-3-3 system. Huachipato drew 1-1 and Cordova had a very solid game once again. He had a 72% pass completion record. He was 3 for 6 on long balls. And I want to highlight that stat because it just shows that he's the type of player who likes pinging the ball up. He did it in the last few matches, had a really good record on it, and it's a good way for Hachipato to create some offense coming from the back. He had seven recoveries as well. He was four for four on his duels as Hachipato now sit 10th in the table with a 1-1-1 one, one, and one record. Considering their struggles last season, I think they'll take that so far up, up to three matches. And I'm very curious seeing this, this player so far because he looks like a very active fullback Cardova. And I would like to maybe see Herdman give him a sniff at some point to see if he is Canadian's national team ready. Moving on over to Ukraine now, Chirimores is looking to sign Manjakar James. As you guys know, Manjakar James has been playing for Vila in the Danish league. They've sit rock bottom of the table. It's been a very frustrating season for Manjakar James, and it looks like he's potentially going to be heading on over to Ukraine. So a very interesting storyline there. There's been a few sources, so we'll have to keep you guys updated with that. But in my opinion, get him out. Get him out of Vila. This is not going to be a good situation for him. He's an interesting player. I don't know what his Canadian national team future looks like, but just given our, our center back depth, it's not a bad option having him there and playing in the Ukrainian league would be an interesting league for him. So I kind of, in my opinion, hope it happens. Moving on over to Greece now, we're going to take a look at Derek Cornelius and Asai Pantelikos, who have been on really, really good form so far. Cornelius has really found a home in Greece, and they proved it once again. And at the weekend, Pantelikos took on Panathinaikos, and this was a, a big uphill battle for them. It seemed like one that they would be heavy, heavy underdogs in, but Cornelius was able to get the start in that match. He played 90 minutes as a center back in that typical 4-2-3-1 system. And Panatolikos with the upset, with a one nothing victory, massive statement win to show that this is a team not to take lightly. We saw them compete with Olympiacos over those two legs in the cup. And with it, they now move up to an 8-4-12 and record, ninth in the table, six points off of the top six, which is a really impressive turnaround. Because I wasn't really sure what this team was all made of and seeing Cornelius kind of settle his way into Greece has been really impressive. And it's a big reason why I keep pushing for him to potentially get a little bit more minutes with the Canadian men's national team, especially with this upcoming window. Heading on over to Portugal now, we're gonna take a look at Steven Vitoria and Stefan Ustakio, who has sides have took on each other at the weekend. It was top of the table against relatively bottom of the table. We're going to start with Steven Vittoria, who's back after suspension. He started and played as the central center back in that 3-4-3 system as Moriense lost one nothing to Porto. But unfortunately for Vittoria, once again, he picked up two yellow cards, was sent off in the 84th minutes once again. And with this result, they unfortunately sit 17th in the table with a 4-7-12 record. Vittoria has now been sent off on back-to-back -back matches. Not really what you want to see. I'm assuming this is maybe a bit of frustration as this side has just not been able to get the job done a lot. They're really struggling right now, second bottom of the table, and this is going to be another massive promotion first relegation push for them. They don't want to go down, and unfortunately lo losing their, their leader, losing Victoria on these type of games is not going to help their case. Looking on the flip side of that result, though, as Moriense looked like they're struggling, Porto absolutely are not. But the thing that does have some worries, and this is something that we should have all realized, January transfers can be scary. They can be nerve wracking. You're taking a risk, taking yourself out of a comfort zone, going into a new team, more than likely a, a better team, a bigger team. And that's exactly what Stefan Ustakio did going into this Porto side who has been absolutely flawless this season. And unfortunately for him, minutes have been a little tricky to come by, has not got a start yet, hopefully potentially in the Europa League, we'll see him at some point. But once again, he was used as a substitute. He came on the 81st minute, not much to talk about as he played as a center mid in that 4-4-2 system. But with Porto winning that one nothing result, they still sit first in the table with a 23-0 record, six points ahead of second place sporting. We just gotta be patient, see what happens with Steph. He's a good player, he'll get his opportunities and hopefully find a way to battle his way into that midfield, but they're looking like they're cruising atop of the table so far. 
Heading on over to Romania, we're going to take a look at Easton Ongaro and his side Uterad, who got a decent result at the weekend. They were down 1 0 before Easton was substituted on on the 64th minute. And in the dying embers of the match, in the 90th minute, to rescue a point, Ongaro had a classy little finish there. His first for the club, first in the league. And to help them get that result, put them ninth in the table with a 7 13 7 record on 34 points. Really cool story from Easton coming from. Edmonton having so much success in the CPL, making his move abroad and then finding his first goal. I was really excited for the kid rocking the number 70 and hopefully he finds an opportunity with that goal to get a little bit more confidence and again try to fight his way into that starting 11. Moving along to Scotland now, we usually have a big list of Canadian players to touch on, but we only got one this week that's really worth mentioning, and it is Harry Patton. We're talking about Harry Patton this week because after the injury that he picked up earlier in the season, after being on really, really good form, he was Again, used as a bit part role, a lot of substitution appearances, but he found his way back into the squad as Patton started and played all 90 minutes as a CDM in a 4-2-3-1 system as Ross County unfortunately lost 2-0 to Hibbs. Patton had 52 touches, a 76% pass completion. He had six recoveries as well. Ross County, with that defeat, sit 10th in the table with a 6, 9, and 12 record. A player, again, I would really like to see get a call up to the Canadian national team, especially given the position. We're going to have to wait and see because he was on really, really good form earlier in the season. He needs to rediscover that a little bit because of this injury setback, but there's no doubt in my mind that he can find his way. Moving along to Serbia now, we're going to take a look at Milan Borjan, whose side in the cup took on Stefan Mitrovic's side, Reninsky. It was an interesting matchup, and it wasn't a lot of drama within the match as it finished nil-nil, but it went to a penalty shootout. In that shootout, unfortunately for Mitrovic, he did miss one, but on the flip side of things for Borjan, he had four penalty saves to help his side reach the quarterfinals. An incredible goalkeeping performance, one that, I mean, us Canadians have sometimes become accustomed to, but to see it like this... Four penalty saves is something spectacular from Milan Borjan. He followed it up as well at the weekend, helping Red Star win 2-1, to one, and they sit second place in the table with a 19-3-1 record on 60 points, five points off the leaders. It's quite a week there for Milan Borjan. Now on the flip side of that, taking a look over at Stefan Mitrovic and his side, Reninsky, who unfortunately were dumped out of the cup with that... With that and I, I, I just had a loss for words, that type of performance that you only wish that your goalkeeper could do. Unfortunately for Mitrovic, as we mentioned, he did miss in the penalty shootout, but there were, I want to stress this out, there were a lot of pictures taking of some Red Star fans shining lights into the penalty takers. It, not a great scene, not really what you want to see. I won't speculate too much on that, but a frustrating and disappointing result there for Stefan. But at the weekend, he was back in business as he started and played all 90 minutes as a center mid in a 5-3-2 system. With that, Renitsky got a draw, nil-nil, and they now sit in 10th place with a 6-10-7 record. Again, the performances coming in from Mitrovic are consistent. They're classy. This kid has got something good. We're hoping to see him get a potential transfer this summer, and if he keeps putting performances like this, keep getting the minutes and adapting to this type of style of football, he's going to find his way, absolutely is. And a lot of love out to him, unfortunately, missing that penalty, but that happens. Part of football. Heading on over to Switzerland now, we're going to take a look at Liam Miller and his side, Basil, who once again, Miller had an impressive performance as he started and played all 90 minutes as a left mid in a 4-1-4-1 system. Miller had 65 touches, two shots. He was dangerous up and down that left-hand side as Basel won 3-0 to sit third in the table with a 10-10-2 record on 40 points, 10 off first place. This is going to be a bit of a battle to see if they can try to make up that type of distance, but regardless, it's still impressive to see them. We want to see them go get as high as they can, and seeing these type of performances from Liam Miller excites all of us Canadian national team fans. Moving along to Turkey now, we're going to take a look at Besiktas, where you're not going to see any feature from Kyle Laren, but Atiba Hutchinson was able to get subbed on in the 67th minute in the, the, the relatively short amount of time he had on the pitch. He had 22 touches, two interceptions, and recoveries, helping Besiktas hold on to a 1-0 win to move them up to six in the table with an 11-8-7 record. Hutch was brought in just after the goal to help lock things down. That's exactly what he did. This is a type of result that needed to grind out. They needed to start getting some of these wins back-to-back to be able to get and push up the table, see if they want a, even a Europa League position this year. But it's good to see that Hutch was able to get used like this, and we're hoping that Laren gets back as soon as he can. And finally, like usual, one of the last players we touch on, if not always the last player we touch on, it is Samuel Adekubi and his side, Hassel Spore, who at the weekend, we got another 
Another classy performance from Adekubi. Two back-to-back very solid performances. Adekubi started and he played all 90 minutes as a left back in a 4-2-3-1 system. As Hazespor lost 2-0 to Fenerbahce, but the, the game, I can't stress it enough, was very solid from Adekubi. As he had three recoveries, clearances, he won eight of his 11 duels, 55 touches with an 88% pass completion. Hazespor now sit eighth in the table with a 12-3-11 record. I know Fenerbahce is one of the best in Turkey, but I still think that the performances from Adekubi are just so consistent. It's exactly what you want from a player of his quality. And I, I always say he's found a home there, but even with losses, he finds a way to, to look in, important and provide a, a role some way, shape or form. And I don't think Adekubi will walk away with that performance with anything less than a smile on his own performance, not the result. But guys, that brings us to an end of this episode of our Canadian National Team Abroad series. Hopefully you guys did enjoy it. Hopefully you guys have some input, especially on the situation with Larea, David's goal scoring form. How is Eustachio going to find a way in? Let me guys know in the comments and hopefully we'll see you guys soon. There's a lot of fun content we have coming up, especially an interview that you guys are really, really going to like. So one last time, guys, if you have not done so, be sure to drop a like, drop a sub, and we'll see you guys next time. Cheers, friends.